What happens when pixels meet paper? This is indeed the question that I aim to touch upon, if not answer, uh, during my talk. Now, I would like to speak about uh, the notion of a hybrid genetic edition and uh, the notion of hybridity more broadly. So uh, today I would like to touch upon, uh, oops, ah yes two kinds of uh, hybridity, uh, one more fundamental than the other. The less fundamental one is the hybrid or dual form of the Beckett Digital Manuscript Project, which furnishes its digital modules, which you can see on the left-hand side, with ancillary print the making of volumes, the picture uh, of which you can see on the right-hand side. I would like to make the case for the principle uh, of such a hybrid edition by foregrounding the role of the editor as the author of such an ancillary volume in the second part of my paper. But the more fundamental kind of hybridity is the one that is inherent in any digital edition of analog texts. In fact, it is safe to say that any such edition is always hybrid since it combines the materiality of the document with the immateriality of the digital medium. Moreover, one could say that there is an interesting inverse relationship in this regard between the print scholarly edition and its digital counterpart. While the former typically focuses on editing an immaterial work, the latter shifts the attention to the material document. Indeed, Hans-Walter Gabler famously postulated the prim primacy of the document in a scholarly edition, and especially in a digital scholarly edition already in 2007. And in his discussion of Gabler's, quote, complete refocusing of editorial perspective, end quote, Peter Robinson notes the confrontation of material documents with immaterial digital media and how this confrontation has prob problematized the notion of text and document. In today's paper, I would like to take Robinson's argument on the materiality or the lack thereof of a digital edition as a starting point, but not because I intend to theorize more on the notion of digital scholarly editing and how it differs from its print counterpart. I leave the theoretical debate to those in the field who are much better placed to carry it out. What I would like to do instead is to discuss the inherent hybridity of a digital scholarly edition from a practical point of view, namely as an editor for the BDMP who is just about to finalize the next module. Perhaps a few words about the BDMP for those of you who are not familiar with it. The Beckett Digital Manuscript Project is a collaboration between the Center for Manuscript Genetics at the University of Antwerp, the Beckett International Foundation at the University of Reading, the Oxford Center for Textual Editing and Theory, the University of Oxford, and the Harry Ransom Research Humanit Humanities Research Center at the University of Texas at Austin, with the kind permission of the estate of Samuel Beckett. As it says on its website, the purpose of the Be Beckett Digital Manuscript Project is to reunite manuscripts of Samuel Beckett's works in a digital way and to facilitate genetic research. The project brings together digital facsimiles of documents that are now preserved in different holding libraries and adds transcriptions of Beckett's manuscripts, tools for bilingual and genetic version comparison, a search engine, and an analysis of the textual genesis of his works. The BDMP currently houses eight editions or modules, as well as Beckett's notebooks, his personal and student library, and a bibliography of his works. Two new modules will be added in the next two months. And the idea is to go up to 26 and to offer a unique complete works edition that is truly inclusive and complete. My paper structure follows the double purpose of genetic criticism. In the first genetic part, I will zoom in on the immateriality or materiality of digital genetic editing, fleshing out the inherent tension between pixels and paper that characterizes it. More specifically, I will discuss the notion of the document and how the affordances and the limitations of the digital technology 
can possibly affect its seemingly sacrosanct, sacrosanct place in the genetic dossier. In the second critical part, I will touch upon the critical aspect of a hybrid genetic edition by highlighting the role of the editor as a guide that helps the user not only to navigate a work's complex genesis, but to draw interpretative conclusions that have a bearing on Beckett's poetics more generally. As befits a digi digital scholarly edition, and especially a genetic one, the BDMP has upheld the primacy of the document from the very start. Besides, the genetic critical methodology that underlies the BDMP implies a careful and diligent selection, collection, and classification of all available documents for a given work in order to compile a genetic dossier. The documents should be described and converted to the digital format exactly as they are found in the physical holding library and should be in the process of digitization. Those are the rules. But what if as an, uh, as an edit editor, you come to discover that the integrity of the document has been compromised already and most probably by the author himself. What should the editor do then? This is the situation I found myself in when I started working on the digital edition of Beckett's short play, Play. What the play is about is less relevant at this moment and I will return to its content in the second part of my talk. The only thing that is important to mention content-wise right now is that the play consists of two parts, part one labeled by Beckett as narration and part two as meditation. Also relevant is the size of the genetic dossier, 29 documents, including translation drafts. Impressive for a play of barely 20 minutes or to be more precise, two times 10 minutes since the whole play is repeated from start to finish. A closer look at the facsimiles of documents sent at our request from the holding libraries has revealed that in some of them, the narration and the meditation parts don't seem to add up, as in the following examples. So the first example is the uh, second draft, which was initially abbreviated in the BDMP as ET2, ET standing for English TypeScript. Um, it is preserved at the uh, Washington University, St. Louis, and comprises nine sheets and was digitized as such by the holding library and sent to us. Um, the, a number of Beckett scholars had noticed several discrepancies in their bibliographical description of English TypeScript 2. But the document remained as it, originally, as it was originally catalogued. On close inspection, it became clear that the TypeScript actually comprised at least two different stages of the composition process, with the last three sheets probably added later by Beckett himself. Similar story with the next example, which was originally abbreviated in the BDMP as ET4, so English TypeScript 4. Now here the situation is slightly more straightforward or even less straightforward if you like, Although catalogued as one document at Washington University, the photocopy, which is kept at the University of Reading, consists of two separate documents. Um, so the, this, the, last four, the last three sheets are actually separated uh, in the other archive, in the Reading archive. Another clue um, is contained in the document itself. Uh, since the beginning of the second part, is labeled 3A part two, probably by Beckett himself in the top margin. So once again, clear indications that in fact, this TypeScript consists of um, two different versions. The uh, last example is actually the most interesting one and I will dwell on it a little longer for that very reason. Once again, it comes from Washington University and was originally abbreviated in the BDMP as ET7, so English TypeScript 7. Um, here too, we have uh, a TypeScript of nine sheets, but the pagination looks a bit strange. So it's paginated one through five, and then all of a sudden one through four. So there is no continuity. 
Um, once again, it seems that the second part was added later, but the case here is pretty straightforward in the sense that I'm quite sure that it was Beckett himself who was the perpetrator. A closer look at ET7 and ET2 convincingly shows that the second part of the latter was once added to the former. So on the top, you see the first part of what is known as ET7, English type root 7, and the bottom part, you see what is known as the second part of e English TypeScript 2. And I suggest, I claim, and I'm pretty sure, that this was once one TypeScript. And I call it a virtual TypeScript because it used to exist, but doesn't exist anymore. If we uh, take a closer look at the last page five of ET7 and page six of ET2, um, there are, there's quite convincing evidence that they used to belong to the same TypeScript. First of all, the pagination continues smoothly. We go from page one, five to page six. Then we have a speech which is deleted on page five of ET7, uh, closer to the bottom of the page. I'm just going to read it because maybe you don't see it very well. I uh, circled it on my slide. So M, one of the characters says, I know now all that was just play and all this, when will all this have been just play? And if you look closely at page six, there is a, a manual edition by Beckett in the left margin top where he alludes to that speech by referring to it as I know now, etc. So clearly this used to be one document and at some point Beckett separated it um, and they became two. The uh, crossed out section uh, on page five of ET7, um, which is in fact the beginning of the meditation part, is not, as Rosemary Poundney puts it, a false start. I suggest that it was only crossed out when Beckett removed the old version of the meditation and replaced it with a new one. What is not entirely clear is why Beckett would attach the removed version to an older document, which is ET2, which already contains its own meditation. But sometimes the author God does move in mysterious ways. In any case, we were faced with three composite TypeScripts for the digital module and had to make some important decisions, given the affordances, but also the limitations of the digital technology. One of the core features of the BDMP is the collation function, or the tool that allows the user to compare versions. This tool is rooted in the manuscript chronology. Since each sentence is tagged to a specific document and all of the documents are given a place in that chronology. In other words, if one and the same document consists of two different parts that represent different stages in the composition process, the chronology will not work properly or not at all. This is why we took a largely counterintuitive decision to split the composite TypeScripts virtually in the module and to order them according to their composition. This has resulted in an even larger genetic dossier, even more documents, and constituted a major violation of the integrity of the document. It is perhaps important to emphasize that we are dealing with documents here, albeit virtual ones, and not versions. In other words, we did assign them new catalog numbers, uh, hence infusing the virtually created documents with some degree of materiality. This solution is of course not ideal as it creates a parallel virtual reality, if you like, in which Play's digital genetic dossier is not the same as its physical manifestation in the archive, as you can see in this table. At the same time, the solution was necessary in order to enable one of the most crucial and useful features of such an addition, namely the ability to compare versions. The hesitation to split the documents was substantial, but the choice to do it has also led me to revisit our enduring fixation on the printed page, 
the fixation that continues in this so-called digital age. I'm fully aware that giving the editors freedom to manipulate archival documents may seem like opening a can of worms. But the nice thing about this solution is that actual documents are not interfered with. They remain safely in the archive in their pristine original state. The crucial role of the editor in making such decisions brings me to the second part of my talk, in which I discuss the BDMP as an example of a hybrid or dual edition. As Elena Pirazzo put it, there are a number of compelling reasons to opt for an amalgam of digital and print technology. Unlike the sprawling and seemingly uncontrolled mass of information in a digital edition, printed books provide a certain embodiment of the text and scholarship, a format that can be reliably quoted and retrieved. Indeed, as we have just seen in the play example, a high number of documents and versions can be confusing even for the editor, let alone the user. Besides, digital editions often seem less durable. They need to be maintained and are often discontinued when the funding runs out. According to Pirazzo, the provision of a print edition alongside a digital edition may help to stabilize the scholarship, subtracting it from the elusive materiality offered by the digital artifacts. Now, I realize that Pirazzo's model of parallel editing is not entirely the same as the BDMP model, but I believe the analogy will suffice for my purposes today. Important as these issues are, what I would like to focus on in the remainder of my talk is the immense interpretative value of a print edition. It is no coincidence that within the BDMP, the editor of a digital module turns into the author of the ancillary volume. So we have a transition from editor to author. The critical angle and the ability to zoom out and take a bird's eye view of the whole avant text and the epigenesis are the two elements that are much more difficult to achieve in a, in a digital edition. This format allows for a limited number of editors' notes and at most an introduction to lay out key moments in the work's genesis. Moreover, the ability to zoom out need not be restricted to one work only. A number of latest and forthcoming BDMP making of volumes are about two or more works, such as play film, um, the volume that's just come out on three plays by Samuel Beckett, Not I, That Time and Footfalls by my colleague James Little, who's also present here, as I'm very glad to see. And uh, my other colleague, my dear colleague, Pim for Hulst, whose um, who's forthcoming book on the radio plays will contain six uh, different plays. So there is a clear tendency towards bringing more works into one volume, which gives the author editors an excellent opportunity to take macrogenetic analysis to a level that transcends the remit of one work. In what follows, I'd like to share my own experiences as the author editor of the BDMP volume of Play Film and to demonstrate how microgenetic research of two works written at around the same time can yield broader insights into their author's poetics. Because of the specific nature of the two works, play being a, pl a stage play and film a film, I've decided to use Beckett's multimedial authorship as the angle for the volume by foregrounding his emerging multimediality in the late 1950s and throughout 1960s. The fact that Beckett was writing play and film more or less simultaneously has left subtle yet clearly present intermedial marks on the genesis of the two works. More recently, Dirk van Hulle has coined the term creative concurrence, which I think is especially productive for Beckett's multimedial authorship, and I will be using this term extensively and gratefully throughout this paper. Perhaps a few words about the two works themselves, given that they're not, not very well known, they don't really belong to Beckett's canon, if you like. Play, um, published in 1964, 
um, presents the audience with three nameless figures in urns who speak at breakneck speed and whose speech is prompted by a spotlight that jumps from one face to another. As we mentioned before, part one is referred by Becker to as narration, and it basically tells a very banal but barely intelligible tale of a love triangle. Uh, and part two, the meditation, is the character's address to their tormentor, the spotlight. And in that address, they basically plead with the spotlight to be relieved from their plight. And one of the central themes of the play is being seen. Indeed, as one of the protagonists puts it, the spotlight to them is, I quote, a mere eye, no mind opening and closing on me. Am I as much as being seen? And the repeat of the place of the da capo structure implies that they are doomed to go on indefinitely. And just to give you a taste of this play, I would like to show you a very brief fragment just on YouTube um, of a posthumous adaptation by <laughs> Anthony Mengele. I said to him, give her up. I said to him, give her up. I swore by all I held my sacred. One morning as I was sitting stitching by the open window, she burst in and flew at me. Give him up, she screamed. He's mine. Her photographs were kind to her. Seeing her now for the first time, full length in the flesh, I understood why he preferred me. We were not long together when she smelled the rat. Give up that horse. She said, or I'll cut my throat. <gasps> Pardon, so help me God. I knew she could have no proof, so I told her I did not know what she was talking about. What are you talking about? I said, stitching away. Someone yours, give up whom? I smell you off him, she screamed. He stinks a bitch. So I had him dogged for months by a first-rate man. No shadow of proof was forthcoming. There was no denying that he continued as assiduous as ever. This and his horror of the merely platonic thing made me sometimes wonder if I were not accusing him unjustly. Yes. What have you to complain of? I said, have I been neglecting you? How could we be together in the way we are if there was someone else? Loving her as I did with all my heart, I could not but feel sorry for her. Fearing she was about to offer me violence, I rang for Erskine and had her shown out her parting words as he could testify if he's still living and has not forgotten, coming and going on the earth, letting people in, showing people out, what the effect that she would settle my hash. I confess it alarmed me a little at the time. She was not convinced, I might have known. I smell her off you, she kept saying. There was no answer to this, so I took her in my arms and swore I could not live without her. I meant it, what is more. Yes, I am sure I did. She did not repulse me. Judge. I'm going to fast forward a little bit to the meditation part, just which is even more fragmented and even more difficult to follow them. I can't. Kissing their sour kisses. I pity them in any case. Yes, compare my lot with theirs, however blessed and... I can't. The mind would have it. It would have to go, yes. Pity them. What do you do when you go out to sift? Am I hiding something? Have I lost? She had means, I fancied, that she lived like a pick. Like dragging a great roller on a scorching day. The strain to get it moving, momentum coming. <sighs> Kill it and strain again. Have I lost the thing you want? Why go out? Why go... And you perhaps pitying me, thinking, poor thing, she needs a rest. Perhaps she's taken him away to live somewhere in the sun. Why go down? Why not? I don't know. Perhaps she is sitting somewhere by the open window, her hands folded in her lap, gazing down out over the olives. Why not keep on glaring at me without ceasing? I might start to rave and <laughs> bring it up for you. Pa no. Dun. Gazing down out over the olives in the sea, wondering what can be keeping him growing cold, shadows stealing over everything, creeping, yes. To think we were never together. Am I not perhaps? All right, I think we've had enough of that before everybody gets totally depressed. Film, unlike um, play, is silent. Um, is black and white, silent, even though it was made in 1965. Um, but Beckett was a huge fan of the silent film era. And it stars Buster Keaton, another remnant of the silent film era, at a very advanced age uh, at the time. And he's the sole character, and basically throughout the film, he's trying to avoid being seen by any pair of eyes, which leads him from the street through the stairs and into a room that is not his own. All this time he's being followed by the camera eye, but he's oblivious to that. And in the final scene, he's confronted with the camera's gaze and sees himself standing in front of him, which implies that one can never escape self-perception. Now, I'll just show you a part of the room scene and the final confrontation. And in the room scene, uh, the protagonist is trying to cover all the eyes that are looking at him. So let's take it from here. So the film is completely silent. There is no sound. There is nothing wrong with your audio settings.
So this gag will go on for a while. So he will get rid of all the animals and be entirely alone, as he would think. And then I will fast, fast forward to the final confrontation. He's looking at some pictures. And then at some point, thinking that he's alone. Yes. Another depressing Beckett work. Let's go back to the presentation. So film, indeed, uh, we have already seen it. The most important thing is that no matter how much O, which is the character's name, is running away, trying not to be seen, he cannot escape being seen by himself. So once again, being seen or not being seen in this case is the theme of uh, the film. And now a few words about the genesis of the two works. As indeed I mentioned, they did happen, they did develop concurrently, but in a peculiar way. So uh, although written in the same period, the genesis of the two works couldn't have been a more different. As you can see on this uh, attempt uh, of mine to reproduce the timeline, uh, it took Beckett almost two years to finish play whereas film was more or less written in two months, more precisely in April, May, uh, 63. Make it started play in April, 1962, and, but put it aside after a very, very productive period in August, September to pick it up again in March, 63, prompted by the need to revise the German translation in the wake of the German, uh, in the run up to the German premiere and to self translate it into French as you can see, the reboot in Play's Genesis practically coincides with the composition of film, which makes the two works a fine example of creative concurrence. <clears throat> because Play was began first but finished later, I will discuss the manifestation of this creative concurrence in two directions and in this order. First, I will look at the influence of Play's early Genesis on film, and then I will look at film's influence on Play's late Genesis. <clears throat> With regard to Play's influence on film, we have already noted the similarity in the theme of both works, so being seen or not being seen, as the case may be in film. The shift from text to image that underlines the composition of Play continues in film, which was conceived as speechless from the outset. Beckett hit upon the Play's theme in August 62 in the heavily revised typescript number six in the BDMP chronology. And you can see when that happens, it's an, it's an addition in the bottom margin in red ink in which he develops this idea of the uh, spotlight being a mere eye, quite unintelligent, opening and closing on me. And then M, the, the, man, the man says, am I as much as being seen? And in the later versions, characteristically, Bikettian, much shorter, mere eye, no mind, opening and closing on me, am I as much as being seen? So the eye is very important in play already. It'll become even more important in film. In film, indeed, the very first version opens with a focus on perception, as indeed the uh, draft is called Perkipi notes. And um, the very first reference is for one I, I being E, plus one him, one, so no decision is yet made, how to uh, refer to the object, O, oh, who does not wish to, revise to, would not be seen. The second draft is a little more elaborate. 
um, all perception revised to ex extraneous perception, suppressed, animal, human, divine, self-perception maintains in being. So very clearly from the very start, the focus is on perception, so on seeing again. The opening shot of film is also telling because the film opens with this extreme close-up on a human eye, on Buster Keaton's eye. Another interesting element that brings two works together is the uh, characters' names. Um, while the first draft of play has proper names, Psyche, Kong, and Nikki, the second one replaces them with pronouns, so S1, S2, H, for she, one, she, two, and he, and from the third draft onwards, we switch to um, initials indicating the sex. So W1, W2M, standing for woman one, woman two, man. This is the first time Beckett uses initials for characters' names. And he adopts the same approach in film. The two characters were initially called H for he, and I for I, um, or E for I, and later revised to O, object, so we move from he to object, and e, i. So it's interesting how he also here the same modus operandi uh, applies in two works being written more or less at the same time. But creative concurrence between the two works also manifests itself on the level of structure. From the outset, the genesis of play was a nearly obsessive exercise in form in which Beckett tried to achieve perfect symmetry in the composition. The two parts, narration and meditation, both open with a chorus section, and a considerable effort was invested in making sure the number of speeches would add up, starting already in the second version, which you're seeing on your screens now. You see the calculation on the second sheet in the uh, top left corner. So it's calculating the speeches by uh, characters, making sure they all add up it's looking for perfect symmetry, in fact. The same obsession uh, is visible in the genesis of film. Not only does it contain a high number of diagrams from the very first draft, the breakdown into largely two parts in the second version that you can see on the screen now. So he mentions the street scene, the stairs scene, the room scene, the stairs scene being basically the bridge between the street scene and the room scene was intended by Beckett to be bridged by what he referred to as analogy. And here I would like to quote Beckett's rather lengthy quote. I think it's important to understand what he's trying to do in film. Um, so Beckett says that he wants to fortify the analogy between the inspection of the street and the inspection of the room in the complete series by having the elements involved inspected in the same order. If it's one, three, five, two, seven, six, we give numbers to the elements in the room. We give numbers to the couples in the street and have them inspected in exactly the same order, by E in the street and by O in the room. It's a kind of integrity, formal integrity. In other words, probably inspired by the symmetrical structure of play, narration and meditation bridged by the short chorus section, Beckett opts for a similar structure in film street scene, going to the room scene, bridged by the short vestibule scene or the stairs scene. The analogy is also fortified by the same number of elements occurring in both scenes. So I, I don't know if you noticed in the room scene, there were some objects, mirror, bed, uh, table, uh, fish tank, cat, dog, and all that was basically paired in the street scene by the people he encounters in the street. So there was this perfect symmetry between the two scenes, or at least that was the idea. It didn't quite turn out that way, but that's a separate discussion. Um, this repetition, the, the idea of repetition may have also been used by, uh, influenced by the place uh, da capo structure. Although the repeat in film is much less straightforward and in fact, quite difficult to discern with the naked eye. The need to be more explicit about his artistic intentions has also compelled Beckett to introduce a new element in the genesis of film, namely explanatory notes. In a slightly revised form, these notes also are also present in the published script. 
it is telling that the first draft of film is called Perkipi notes, and the second draft is divided into the script proper and the notes that follow it. So the notes play a very important part in the genesis. What is even more interesting is that the strategy, ostensibly so alien to Beckett, as he notoriously refused to explain his work, seeped through to play right at the time of the play's German premiere in June 1963. So by that time, the film script was largely finished. Around that time, another major revision occurs in play, influenced, in my opinion, by the notion of the camera eye in film. The revision from multiple spots to one single spot. So you can see in this particular uh, fragment of the typescript on your screens, the typed layer still contains a reference to spotlights. So their speech throughout act will be provoked by spotlights. That's crossed out. And there is a marginal addition by Beckett, which refers to a spotlight projected on faces alone. It seems like a very minor revision, but in fact, it had very large consequences. Uh, it was so important, even that revision, revision that it warranted an, an explanatory note uh, on light, in which Beckett underscores the spot's inquisitorial nature by referring to it as a unique inquisitor and the helplessness of his trapped victims. Just like O in film cannot escape E, the eye of self perception, so are the three protagonists in play forever doomed to endure the spot's mere eye. Now I'm coming to my conclusion now. I could go on about other possible mutual influences, but given most of you are not Beckett scholars, I don't want to overload you with too much detail, and I apologize if I have done so already. However, such level of detail is familiar to anyone involved in scholarly editing, digital or otherwise. It is indeed the editor's task to make the edition as accessible and user-friendly as possible without making too many compromises regarding its complexity, complexity and granularity. But let us not forget that the editor is the first user of their edition, and they too may not see the wood for the trees and lose their way in the jungle of versions and variants. Having to write a book that is making the transition from editor to author is an excellent way to stay in course and to keep seeing the big picture. By writing an ancillary volume about the genesis of a given work, the author editor navigates the edition and draws a much needed map for other users. Moreover, they turn this map into a proper guidebook by highlighting landmarks and suggesting interesting paths to explore the most efficient to explore it in the most efficient and enlightening ways. Making this guide also enables the author editor to zoom out and draw macrogenetic conclusions, which is especially productive if more than one work is discussed, like in the case of the making of play film volume. By drawing on the genetic analysis of the two works and establishing their creative concurrence, I have been able to pinpoint a number of shifts in Beckett's poetics more generally, such as a shift from text to image, a shift from his largely solitary prose writing to a more collaborative creativity in the theatre and on the film set, and a shift from Beckett's initial intention to keep his genres distinct to multimedial authorship and transmedial adaptations. I believe that only a hybrid form of editing, the combination of a digital edition and a print volume, can enable this kind of scholarship. Instead of sending the print volume to the grave in this digital age, we should take advantage of the affordances it still has to offer and build on its perfect complementarity with the digital technology. I would even venture to suggest that the so-called analog form of writing is not going to disappear anytime soon, despite the fact that most of the literary texts today are labeled born digital. As my colleague Lamik, who is also present here tonight, will confirm, Many authors still use both paper and word processor to write, especially using pen and paper for the outline and developing plot and characters, and typing up the semantic layer afterwards. This means that the marriage of pixels and paper will endure in the foreseeable future, making not only the editing, but also the writing truly, truly hybrid.
Thank you for your attention.